<laughs> well, good morning again. I think I heard a good morning again. All right. Enthusiasm. Yes. Okay, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we could, we could be in your word together. Um, God, and as we, as we open this word, I, I pray that we would see how sovereign it is that you really are. God, I pray that we would see your sovereignty on every page, see that you're in control of all things and that you are orchestrating them um, for the good of those who, who love you and are called according to your purpose. Lord, I, I pray that as, as we do this, that, uh, that we would really see your word. And as a result of that, we would see you. God, please don't let us just, just don't let us stop with reading the words off of a page or, or talking about the words and just letting them be words, God. But instead, I pray that we would know you more as a result of this time together. God, I pray that you would guide us and that you would direct us, Lord, and uh, that we would love you more. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, if you have a Bible with you, I would invite you to open it to the book of Ruth. Um, if you're not sure where that is, it's the A book. Don't hesitate to use the index. There's nothing wrong with using table of contents. So if you're not sure where Ruth is, feel free to use that. It's a very small book, but it is one that I at least wanted to take some time to touch on as we're going through this Bible reading plan. Um, and, and I'm... <laughs> I'm going to sound a little exaggerated today, but I really believe this. So, yeah, I can exaggerate if I really believe it, right? Um, I really believe that this is the word that we need to hear today. Today. Like, not next week. We need to hear this word today. Because my intention was to preach this message next week. But I believe that God is sovereign and he orchestrated things so that I would be here this week. Thank you, Mike. Um, so... I am going to preach this message this week, which also means that we're going to get to hear something different next week, but um, that's to be determined. So I am glad that I get to be here with you guys today. Um, like I said, I wasn't supposed to be here. As a matter of fact, I was supposed to be sitting on a beach where it was going to be sunny and 75, but instead yesterday I was sitting in my house looking out the window where it was snowing and freezing cold. So it's a little bit different, but I genuinely believe that God in his sovereignty orchestrated all of this so that I would be here with you today, which means that I, I'm not just saying this, I genuinely believe that somebody needs to hear this message today, today. So I'm glad I get to be here with you guys. I really am. I really am. Sunny and 75 sounds nice, but I'm glad I get to be here. Seriously, I am glad to be here with you all today. But you know, as I thought about this, as I thought about this, it, it applies perfectly to the text we're going to look at. Um, as we go through this text, I want to I look at three major themes from the book of Ruth, and I'm going to try to cover the entire book. So we're going to move pretty fast, but um, we're only, for the sake of time, we're only going to read one chapter, but we're going to give an overview of the entire book. Um, so... I thought about this in light of what we're going to be looking at and how God sovereignly orchestrates everything together and how he is orchestrating all things for his good purposes. Um, and the way we respond to that really does matter. The way we respond to that really does matter. And once we've accepted the fact that God is sovereign over things, it changes everything. I mean, it really does. See, I thought about this, and I thought, you know, I could be angry about this. I could be angry. <laughs> oh, boy, I could be angry. Um, but it wouldn't do much good, would it? <laughs> I wouldn't do much good if I was angry about it. I could be sad. I could be disappointed. But the truth is, because I know the God that is in control of all things, because I know that he promises that he's working all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes, because I know that, it changes everything. I can trust those words from Romans 8, 28, where he says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And because of that, everything changes. Our attitudes change. What way we respond to circumstances changes. It all changes. And I know what Paul is dealing with here is far bigger than not sitting on a beach. I know he's dealing with something far bigger than that as he's sitting in prison or he's, he's dealing with this affliction that he talks about. Uh, 
I know that what he's dealing with is far bigger struggle than what I've got. I know that. So please don't hear me say my, my issues are the same as Paul's because that is not the case. But I think the principle is still true. I think the principle is still true. I'm here with you guys today. I am here today with you guys with this word from God talking about Ruth for my good and for your good if you love him and you are called according to his purposes. That should be encouraging for you guys. That's encouraging for me. It was a little stressful at first, but it's good. And I can trust God knowing that he's working it together for my good. Isn't that mind-blowing? Like, negativity surrounds us. Like, it is everywhere right now. And we can just rest assured knowing that God is working it for our good. Whoo, that's good news. That is good news. So like I said, we're going to focus our time on the entirety of Ruth, but for the sake of time, we're only going to read chapter four, and we'll do that here in just a moment. So hang on just a minute. But I need to at least walk you through chapters one through three. Okay, there, it's a short book. There are only four chapters, but I do at least need to walk us through the first three chapters so that way we have the context for what we're talking about. Um, and, and I actually love this book because of where it's set. For those of you who have been following along with this reading plan, if you're not, I would encourage you. There's still time to get involved with this reading plan. You can pick up at any point and start reading the Bible along with us. Um, but for those of you who have been reading, you see where this is set. It says right in the very first words of Ruth that this is in the time of the judges. And judges, even though it's a time of brutality and chaos and just a lot of, a lot of ugly things, there's a lot of really neat I say neat, that's, bad. that's a bad word for this. There are a lot of big stories. There's a lot of big narratives here um, with, honestly, things that we would go and we would watch in the movie theaters. I know because movies like Samson have been made. I mean, these are big stories, and that's what we're stepping into as we step into Ruth. This is in the time of the judges. It's a time of corruption and disobedience to God where judges actually says that the people did what they thought was right in their own eyes. They basically did whatever they wanted to do if they thought it was right. They could steal, they could cheat, they could kill. Whatever they did, as long as they thought it was right, that's what they did. They did what was right in their own eyes, not in what was right, not what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So that's the setting that we're stepping into. And right away in chapter one, we meet this guy named Elimelech. This guy named Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and these two are leaving Bethlehem and Judah to go to Moab because there's this famine in the land, okay? So they're picking up and they're moving. But this is problematic. This is problematic for a couple of reasons, okay? If you're an Israelite, you don't just go to Moab and settle down. You just don't. And there's some very good reasons for that. First of all, Moabites were not well liked by the Israelites. They came from the line of, of Lot, go all the way back to Abraham and Lot. The Moabites come from the line of Lot and his ancestral relationship with his own daughter. Then we find that the Moabites are prohibited from the Lord's assembly in Deuteronomy 23. Plus, there's this whole history of Moabites leading Israelites to worship false gods. Moabites were not well-liked people in Israel. And the second reason that this is problematic is Elimelech and Naomi have two sons. And these two sons are going to need to be married. But intermarriage with foreigners was not encouraged. Not only that, it was prohibited. You don't do that. You don't go and intermarry. And I wanted to make a quick side note. For those of you who are unmarried, criteria number one, do you love Jesus? That is criteria number one. Do you love Jesus? I don't care if they look good. I don't care if they sound good. I don't care. If they don't love Jesus, just end it now and save yourself a lot of problems. Okay, do you love Jesus? Criteria number one. Okay, anyway, that was a side note. I don't want to chase that rabbit too far. So they're here in Moab. They go to Moab and <laughs> Elimelech dies here in Moab. So now Naomi's a widow, but she's still got her two sons, right? So these two sons, they go and they do the unthinkable and they marry Moabite women. They go and marry these Moabite women, which again, is not allowed. But then, as fate would have it, her sons die. So now you have these three widowed women living in a, well, a foreign land to Naomi. 
But then she decides, well, hey, the famine is over back home in Bethlehem. I should just go back home. I'll go back home where I've got family. And she decides that she's going to go back home empty-handed to Bethlehem. So she calls her daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law in and tells them, go back to your people. Just go on back where you can maybe go back to your mother's house and you can have some kind of safety. You can have, be provided for somehow. So go on back. And what do they do? They both refuse. Both of them refuse. Both Ruth and Orpah, these daughters-in-law, they both refuse. So Naomi pushes the issue. She presses it and she uses logic, right? She uses this logic. Like even if you were willing to wait around for me to have another son who you could marry, you're going to be too old by then and it's hopeless for you. Move on, like go back home. So she uses logic to try to get them to go back to their mother's house. And finally, Orpah gives in and she goes back to her mother's house. And it also says to her gods. So not only is she abandoning Naomi, she's also abandoning the Lord. She's abandoning Yahweh. So she's going back to her gods. But that's not the way Ruth responds, is it? Literally what the text says that Ruth does is to cling to her mother-in-law. And this word cling is a really important one. Literally, literally the text here that says that she clings to her, it's the same word that is used all the way back in Genesis chapter two, verse 24, where it says that a man is to leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. We use this all the time to talk about marriage relationships, like a husband should cling to his wife, a wife should cling to her husband. But here, Naomi, or Ruth is clinging to Naomi. She's saying nothing is going to get between us. And we actually get this outpouring of love from Ruth on Naomi as she promises that she's going to go with her, live with her, adopt Naomi's people as her own, worship her God, and even be with her until death. And then she says this really radical thing in, in, in verse 17. She asks the Lord, Yahweh, to punish her if anything outside of death separates them. Literally what she's saying here to Naomi is, till death do us part. That's how close this relationship is. That's how close Ruth says that she will be to Naomi. She is clinging to Naomi. So finally, Naomi gets the point. She realizes Ruth is not going away, is she? She's not leaving me alone. So she gives up. And they head back to Bethlehem. And when they get to this little town of Bethlehem, yeah, I'll sneak that in there. When they get to this little town of Bethlehem, the place is buzzing, right? People hear, well, hey, Naomi's coming home, so here she comes, and everybody's talking about it. Some locals recognize her. But then they start this conversation with her, and Naomi's like, no, please don't even call me Naomi. You've got to call me Mara, because Naomi means pleasant one. She's thinking, I'm not pleasant anymore. No, I said, you've got to call me Mara, which Mara means bitter one. So she's gone to this foreign land. She comes home 10 years later and she says, I am no longer pleasant. I am embittered. And just think, just think for a minute about how Ruth would be feeling as she's standing here hearing this. Like you went away empty or you went away full and you came home empty. And I'm here and you're saying you're empty even though I'm still, I'm trying to give everything to you. You know how hard that would be for Ruth to hear? I don't know about you. I think that, that would be damaging to me. I think that would hurt. I think it would sting for a long time. But Ruth is devoted to Naomi. Ruth is devoted to Naomi, even though Naomi says she has nothing but bitterness and that the Almighty has afflicted her. And chapter one, chapter one comes to a close with just a small glimmer of hope. And if you're not careful as you're reading this, you just miss this, okay? This is one of those small things that you might miss. Chapter one, it says, they arrived at Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. There's just this glimmer of hope as they come back and you see the barley harvest in springtime where, where there's just new life, there is new hope, there are new beginnings, and that's the way chapter one closes. And then we open up in chapter two. I promise we'll move pretty quick through these. But chapter two opens up with Ruth asking to go out in the fields and pick up, pick up this leftover grain that the harvesters drop so she can walk behind them and glean all of this for Ruth and Naomi. And Naomi gives her permission, and then I love what happens. Ruth just happens to go to the field of Boaz. Literally, the text says that she just happens to go to the, Ruth, or to the field of Boaz, and he is one of Elimelech's family members. And while she's working, Boaz just happens to show up, and he happens to take notice of her, and he asks about her, and his servants fill him in. Say, hey, that's Ruth, the Moabitess. <laughs> 
So Boaz goes past the servants and goes down to talk to Ruth. And he tells her to stay here. Like, keep, keep gleaning in my fields with my female servants, and you're going to be safe. I'll make sure that you're protected. And he looks out for her. And essentially, what Boaz is saying, you just keep working here. I'll take care of the pr- protection. But then he takes it a step further. After some back and forth conversation, he invites her to come and eat with him. And she goes and she eats her fill. And then she even gets to take a doggy bag home. Yeah, she, she get, she's got a maid. Keep in mind, this is a poor foreigner who is now going home to her mother-in-law with leftovers. So she goes home after a hard day's work and Naomi looks at her like, what did you do? Where have you been? What, what is, how did you get all this? Where did this come from? And she finds out where she's been working and she, it's like the light bulb comes on for her and she says, hey, Boaz is actually a family redeemer. So Ruth continues to work in Boaz's fields and that's the end of chapter two. So then we run into chapter three and here Naomi starts to concoct this plan to get Boaz's attention. She's like, we're gonna get his attention. So she tells Ruth to go and to wash and to put on perfumed oil and to dress up. And then she does this, she tells her to do what, if we were to do this, this would be weird, but it makes sense. We'll explain it in just a minute. But she's told to go down to the threshing floor where Boaz is sleeping and uncover his feet and lie down. Okay, Boaz is here at the threshing floor where all this grain is piled up and that wasn't uncommon. They would do that to protect their grain. Because if you just leave it out here in this field by itself, then you've got these raiders that are going to come in and steal this. So Boaz, being the owner of this field, stays in his field to protect, protect his income. He's protecting what he's going to eat. He's protecting his, his belongings. So he's there. She comes down, uncovers his feet, and lays down. <laughs> this scene cracks me up. I don't know if anybody else thinks this is funny, but I, I get a kick out of this. Boaz is laying here asleep, and when he wakes up in the middle of the night and looks down by his feet, not only are they freezing, but there's this woman sitting at your feet. Just picture this for a minute. It's not like he flips on the light switch and you can see what's going on. No, I picture this like there's a little bit of moonlight, and you can faintly see the silhouette of a person down here by your feet when you're thinking, hey, I've got to protect everything from raiders. (laughs) And here's this woman here by your feet. Does nobody else think that's funny? It cracks me up. (laughs) So here she is. Here she is all dressed up, perfumed up, washed up, and he's groggy and he wakes up and just barely sees the silhouette of a person in the moonlight. And I I would freak out a little bit. I might lose control. Um, So he panics a little bit and he says, who are you? And he finds out who she is. And she says, I'm Ruth, your servant, Take me under your wing, for you are a family redeemer. Now, this is important, because essentially, what Ruth has just said is, will you marry me? Do you realize this? Now, that's a way to propose. Whew. Will you marry me? That's the picture that's being brought here. As she says, take me under your wing. Literally, it's saying, put your arm around me and draw me close to your ribs. And it's symbolic of, you know, Adam's rib being removed to form, the, to form Eve. And now you're going to bring her under to draw her close and the two become one. And she's saying, bring me under your wing, under your protection. I want you to marry me. That's what she's doing here. I can just picture Boaz still kind of groggy hearing all this. And Boaz says, you know what? Why don't you just stay here till morning? We'll talk about this in the morning, okay? And he tells her to stay here. He says, look, there is a closer redeemer. And basically this closer redeemer has first dibs on your land, on marriage to you. He's got first dibs. But if he won't redeem you, I will. If he won't take you under his wing, I'll take you under mine. So morning comes, Ruth goes home with a whole bunch of grain and reports everything back to Naomi, which leads us up to chapter four. So if y'all would stand with me, let's read chapter four together. Chapter four, verse one says, Boaz went to the gate of the town and sat down there Soon the family redeemer Boaz had spoken about came by. Boaz said, come over here and sit down. So he went over and sat down. 
Then Boaz took ten men of the town's elders and said, Sit here. And they sat down. He said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who, had return, who has returned from the territory of Moab, is selling the portion of the field that belongs to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you. Buy it back in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, do it. But if you do not want to redeem it, tell me so that I will know, because there isn't anyone other than you to redeem it, and I am next after you. I want to redeem it, he answered. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from Naomi, you will acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased man, to perpetuate the man's name on his property. The Redeemer replied, I can't redeem it myself, or I will ruin my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption, because I can't redeem it. At an earlier period in Israel, a man removed his sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make any matter legally binding concerning the right of redemption or the exchange of property. This was the method of legally binding a transaction in Israel. So the Redeemer removed his sandal and said to Boaz, Buy back the property yourself. Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife to perpetuate the deceased man's name on his property so that his name will not disappear from among his relatives or from the gate of his hometown. You are witnesses today. All the people who were at the city gate, including the elders, said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. May you be powerful in Ephrathah and your name well known in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the son of Tamar, who bore Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this woman. Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. He slept with her, and the Lord granted, her con- granted conception to her, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who, is, who has not left you without a family redeemer today. May his name become well known in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better than seven sons, has given birth to him. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and became his nanny. The neighbor, the neighbor women said, A son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the family records of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nahashan. Nahashan fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Thank God for his word, and you may be seated. So, there's the overview of Ruth. Yeah, that took a while. Okay, that's the overview of Ruth. So what I want to do today, I want to look at three themes, and I promise we'll move pretty quick through these, but three themes that inform the way we live today. Three themes from the book of Ruth that inform the way that we live today. First of all, we should live with an acceptance of God's sovereignty, We should live with an acceptance of God's sovereignty. I mean, just think about how this story moves along. Think about this story for just a minute and how it moves along, okay? It all starts with a famine. It's what starts this whole thing. It's what gets the ball rolling. And clearly, I think if I ask all of you who is in control of what the weather does, you're going to say God's in control of that, right? I don't think many people think that we're in control of the weather. I can't make it rain. I doubt you can. So... God is in control, and that's what starts this whole thing. Then we move forward, and we find that there are these three deaths in Moab. Clearly, God is in control of life and death. He is the one who who gives life and sustains it. So the family finally, the the famine is over, so they go back to Bethlehem. Once again, God is in control of this. Then Ruth just happens to go to the field of Boaz, even though... Keep in mind, even though she has no idea which land belongs to which person, and likely she probably doesn't even know who Boaz is since we find that Naomi has to explain it to her later. But she just happens upon this field. And then she just happens to be working in this field when Boaz arrives. 
Because remember, it also says that she had spent some time up in the shelter house resting in the shade. What if she had been in the shelter house when Boaz shows up? She wouldn't have been there for him to take notice of. So he just happens to notice this one woman who is down here working with all of these, all of these men, all of these poor people who are out here trying to glean these things from the side, edge of the field. And here he notices her. Hmm. Sin. He decides to make this plan and he goes out and he sits at the city gate and he just happens to wait until this closer redeemer comes by. It's a good thing he was coming by that day. And that closer redeemer just happens to defer redemption of Ruth and the land to Boaz, who then marries Ruth and it's, the text says, the Lord granted conception to her. God is in control of all of this. Step by step. Isn't that awesome? There are four chapters in Ruth, and God's fingerprints are on all of it. Probably the biggest theme of the book of Ruth is God's sovereignty over everyday, ordinary activity. Over and over and over again, God is orchestrating things for his good purpose, and they have no idea, no clue what's going on. They're doing their best to make the best decisions they can. They moved to Moab because of this famine. Okay, we're just trying to provide food. The sons die. That's, it's a tragedy. But God is still working that for his good purposes. She goes to this random field and it just happens to be this one who has the chance to redeem her and buy her back. And through all of this, there just happens to be a child born who would be the grandfather of David who is in the ancestry of Jesus. <laughs> wow! What a coincidence. No? Not a coincidence? I don't think so either. God's sovereignty is all over this little book. He makes these little things happen all over the place to bring about his good purposes. But I started thinking about this to, uh, in light of our context now. And I started thinking just a little bit about where Elimelech, Naomi, their two sons and their future daughters-in-law are the only ones affected by this famine. Of course not. Of course not. This famine affected thousands, if not millions of people. But you see how God is using this, this big picture famine to do little picture things. You see that. God moved his people where he intended them to be to fulfill his good purpose. So I mentioned earlier, I mentioned kind of in the beginning of this whole, whole ball of wax that I believed that God canceled my trip so that I would be here with you this morning and I absolutely believe that that is true. I believe you're here for a very specific reason. I don't know what that is, I'm not gonna pretend I do, but I believe that God is orchestrating even the small things that we might overlook and think are unimportant for his purposes. Or even this, those big picture things. Coronavirus right now is a big picture thing. I believe God is orchestrating that for your good today. Amen. That's good news. I absolutely believe that that is true, that he is working in thousands or millions or even billions of other people's circumstances simultaneously to bring about his good and perfect plan because our God is in the details. And I think that should directly affect the way that we live right now. The way that we live right now. Because when we acknowledge and accept God's sovereign reign over all things, there is, first of all, there's far less pressure for you and I to be perfect. Far less pressure on us, isn't there? I mean, if you get to thinking like, okay, if I screw this up, if I make a mistake, does that derail God's perfect plan? <laughs> Don't give yourself so much credit. Of course not. There is far less pressure on you. Does that mean that we go about living like it doesn't matter? Of course that's not what that means. But there is far less pressure on you. You can live far more freely because the God who is in control of every little detail is sovereignly orchestrating things for the good of those who are called according to his purposes. Isn't that good news? So there's far less pressure for us to be perfect, but even more than that, when things get ugly, 
when things get ugly, not if things get ugly, when things get ugly, I mean, we can know that God isn't surprised by that. (laughs) He's not shocked like, oh no, we have to call an audible now because I didn't see this coming. God isn't confused. God isn't worried. Instead, our God is working in this thing to complete his perfect plan. I mean, okay, maybe, maybe you're tired of hearing about coronavirus, so I'll stop talking about it for a minute. Let's, let's make it a little more personal then. There's a death of a loved one, unexpected death of a loved one. You didn't see it coming. It hurts. Sure, it hurts. I'm not going to pretend that you can't have emotions because of that or you can't feel pain because of that. I think that would be reckless and irresponsible. But, but we can know that God is working in that to bring about his good plan. I don't think Naomi was looking forward to the death of her husband. I certainly don't think she was looking forward to the death of her sons. But God even worked in that for her good. So I hope that brings you some comfort in the struggle. I hope that brings you some kind of peace and and just assurance knowing that God is working even in those things that are devastating. Or maybe your car breaks down and you aren't sure how you're going to pay for it. You can approach it with confidence knowing that God is going to work even in this for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And I think that is the number one biggest theme throughout the book of Ruth is that God is sovereign over all things. We see, but listen, We see Ruth, we see Boaz, we even see Naomi living and acting all while God is carrying out his good and perfect plan behind the scenes. It doesn't mean that we just sit back idly and trust that God's going to go do all the work for us. Instead, we go and work and trust that God's going to work in and through it. That's what we need to do. And I think we do when we live life with an acceptance of God's sovereignty. So we should. We should live life with that acceptance. And then we should also live as the image of God's love. I think we need to live as the image of God's love. And there are several pictures of God's love here throughout the book of Ruth. Several pictures of God's love throughout the book of Ruth. For the sake of time, I just want to show I just want to show you two of them. And I I, I'll we'll get just these two and then we'll move on. Okay. So first of all, Look at Ruth's love for Naomi. I know I touched on this a little bit already. Ruth's love for Naomi. We see this woman literally clinging to her (laughs) mother-in-law. How many of you love your mother-in-law this way? Rhetorical question, don't answer. Um, Especially those of you who have your mother-in-law here, please don't answer that question. Um, But this is the picture of true love. This is the picture of true love, not some Hollywood romance love that has been entirely too exaggerated. This is a woman who loves her mother-in-law and her mother-in-law's God who is willing to forsake everything that she knows to love her, to cling to her. And recognize what Ruth has to leave behind here. Just think about what Ruth has to leave behind here in this book. Ruth is leaving her home. She's leaving her family. She's leaving her security since her husband is dead and she could go back to her parents' home. And she is also leaving the religion that she once knew to go and follow her mother-in-law and her mother-in-law's God. She says, I'm gonna give it all to go follow you. All because she loves Naomi and has devoted herself to her and the Lord. And if we're being totally honest, just completely black and white, Most of us would have to question if we love anybody this way. I put spouses, but I think it goes further than that. Most of us would have to question, would I love anybody enough to follow them anywhere and give everything for them? But this is what love is. This is the picture of love that we're giving here. And I think the best, the best illustration of this in the New Testament is, I mean, just think about what the disciples did when they went to follow Jesus. Think about what they had to give up. They left everything behind to go follow Jesus. They left their family. They left their security and their jobs. They left their homes. They left everything and sold out to go follow Jesus because, well, they loved him. They gave up everything to go follow him. The question is, do you love Jesus the way that Ruth loves Naomi? Do you love him enough to leave everything behind for the sake of going and following him? And I think when we follow Jesus, when we become like Jesus, we become a picture of God's love to the world. 
So there's a second picture, though, that I want to touch on. This second picture of love is, is Boaz and his love for Ruth. Okay, which actually, I want to tie this in directly to this third point here, okay? So we should live with an acceptance of God's sovereignty. We should live as the image of God's love. But third, we must live with a knowledge of God's redemption. We must live with a knowledge of God's redemption. Clearly, Boaz loves Ruth, right? Clearly, she lo- clearly he loves her. He's, he's sacrificing an awful lot to go get her. So clearly, he loves her. But I think that there's something bigger than just a romance story going on here. I don't think it's just a romance story, okay? If it was, it'd be a good one. But I think it's bigger than that. I think that this is a picture of the way that Christ has redeemed the church. And let me explain. When Ruth first arrives in the field of Boaz, she's nothing terribly exciting. She's nothing terribly special, is she? Okay? She is poor, She's been widowed, so in that time, widows a lot of times were marginalized. She's a foreigner and a Moabite at that. She's probably not looking her best here. Keep in mind, she has been out here working in this field all day, so she's probably sweating. She's probably not all dressed up, which we get indications of because later on she has to go wash and change her clothes. So she's not looking real good out here in the field, but Boaz steps out into this field and he sees her. Her, even though she is nothing special at this point. As a matter of fact, a lot of people would have turned and run from her. But he sees her. While she's just trying to eke out some kind of sustenance, something to sustain her and Naomi, but little does she know that God has something far greater in store for her. And then Boaz, Boaz, because he loves her, because he loves her, he goes out of his way. Chapter 2, verse 5 says Boaz says that Boaz goes and he asks his servant about who she is. And then in verse 8, Boaz goes out of his way to go talk to her directly. Now, this is the owner of the land humbling himself enough to go and talk to this lowly poor widow out here working away in his field. And he seeks her out, goes to her, and begins this whole conversation. Keep in mind, Boaz is the one with the wealth. He's the one with the status with everything while Ruth has nothing to offer. Nothing to offer here. And even though, even though the closer redeemer didn't want her, Boaz did. (laughs) Boaz wants her. Remember, the closer redeemer said that he wants the land. He wants the good things that come with her. But then, Ruth becomes a deal breaker, right? Chapter four, verse four says that he he clearly states he wants to buy the land back. But then after he's told that Ruth is a part of this deal, he he backs up and says, no, 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 I'm not interested in that, that lowly Moabitess. I don't want anything to do with her. So no, you take the field and take her. I don't want that. But Boaz says, I'm going to give everything. I'm willing to take it because I want her as my wife. And he overcomes all obstacles that he has to and spends his own money because he loves her. And like I told you, this is a romance story for sure. But I think it's something far greater than that. I think it's something far bigger than that. What this is doing is foreshadowing what Jesus would do years and years later. And he would come and he would forsake his own wealth, his own power, his own dignity for the sake of a few poor, lowly sinners. That's the picture we get here. That's what Boaz is doing. He goes out of his way to buy her back to himself. Even though though we, unlike Ruth, willingly rebelled against it. Boaz had it all, yet he placed his affections on her, just like Christ comes and willingly places his affection on us, even though we have nothing to offer. That's the good news of this. So we should live with an acceptance of God's sovereignty, and we should live as the image of God's love, but we must live with the knowledge of God's redemption. So what? Well, we can live with a fear of tomorrow. You're welcome to live with a fear of tomorrow, but you don't have to. You don't have to. You can live with a confidence knowing that God is working all things out. I mean, 
look, if you call yourself a Christian, if you say you belong to Christ, you should live fundamentally different lives. You should live lives of peace and confidence and boldness, knowing that God is good and he is in control of everything, working things for your good. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? God is working everything, even the ugly things, for your good. And if that doesn't inspire some confidence, I don't know what will. The God who spoke all things into, being, into existence wants you to experience good things. Oh, that's good news. Even when you don't think it's good, he's working it for your good. And then my question would be, if this is the kind of life we can live as Christians... Why don't we? Why don't we? I mean, I'm, don't, please don't hear me say I've got this all figured out because I, I certainly live li a life that sometimes is or is scared or unsure or confused about what's coming. And I, I have doubts and I have questions and some of those are never going to be answered. At least not this side of heaven. But, but, when we realize that our God who is for us is actually working all of these little things out, that changes the perspective an awful lot and it gives you a confidence to keep moving forward and trusting him. So I encourage you to live that kind of life. But the beauty of this kind of confidence is that it frees you up to live a life of love and service to Christ. This, I mean, to sacrifice everything to do what God has called you to do and you don't have to be afraid to talk to the person down the street about Jesus because our God is good and he's going to work that for good. You don't have to be afraid even to go to some really difficult context because life, death, anything else, anything that stands between you and your goal is nothing compared to our God. Nothing. This is nothing compared to our God. Nothing compared to it. And he is working all of those things out. And I don't think we have to live in fear we don't have to live in chaos because God makes it possible for us to, to be like David. I, I thought of Psalm 23, verse four, where it says, even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We can have that kind of confidence, that kind of confidence to walk through hardship, knowing that God is in control. But like I said, even though I think the biggest theme is God's sovereignty, I think maybe the most important theme is what we must do, what we must know, and that is God's redemption. The first two things are good things to do. They are important things, but the final thing is a must do. And if you don't, if you don't have the knowledge of God's salvation, I think that we're living like Ruth and Naomi did in chapter one and two with uncertainty and fear and just trying to eke out some kind of existence and keep going on, living in poverty and shame and regret. Little do they know, though, that there is a Redeemer. Isn't that a song? There is a re You guys don't want to hear me sing. You know the song. But there is a Redeemer who is willing and able to take you from where you were in that shame and fear and regret in all of that ugliness of life, but he's willing to take you from there to his strength and his riches and his fortune, just like Boaz does for Ruth. And I think that is the most important thing here. And the question is, are you going to be humble enough to go and uncover his feet, lay down at his feet and just say, hey, will you take me under your wing? Will we demonstrate that kind of humility? That's the big question I think that Ruth leaves us with. Are we willing to show that kind of humility to fall before the feet of, a, of the Redeemer and say, will you take me in? Will you take me from my regret to your power? Will you take me from my shame and my fear to your riches? Will you do that for me? And the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Even if nobody else wants anything to do with you, Jesus says, I will come and I will take you from the ugly and I will put you in my riches. <laughs> That is the point of Ruth. That is the point. There is a redeemer who is willing to change everything for you and take you from the, the, the fear to his strength. So if you're willing to humble yourself enough to fall at his feet and ask him for his protection, for his, for his goodness in your life, he won't turn you away. He'll do whatever it takes, overcome any obstacle to redeem you. That's the good news of Ruth. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word from Ruth.
God, I thank you for, for showing us your sovereignty, for showing us your power, and the simple fact that you are in control of all things, and you work them out for our good. God, what an awesome encouragement we have in that. Lord, and I, I want to pray that we could live with a confidence that comes from knowing that. God, I pray that you would cast all doubt of that aside, that we would focus on you and know your power and your grace and your goodness, God, and that we might just go live life freely, loving other people the way that you loved us, showing them that there is, in fact, a Redeemer who is close by, that he's not distant, even though, God, we look at these, we look at these women here who are living lives completely, completely ignorant of the fact that there is a Redeemer who is right there, who is in their midst, who is present, who is willing and able to redeem them. God, I pray that you would take us from chapter two to chapters three and four, where we fall before you, where we humble ourselves before you and fall at your feet and say, God, take us from our shame, take us from our regret, take us from our pain and our fear and, and put us into your strength. God, we pray that you would take us under your wing. Lord, and if there's, if there's any person here who has not been living the life that we should live or living the life that we must live, with a knowledge of your salvation, I pray that that would change today and that we might go and live in the confidence of knowing you. And Lord, most importantly, for anybody who doesn't know you, who hasn't submitted to you as, as, as Lord, God, I pray that they would make that decision to fall, and fall before you, fall on their faces at your feet today. God, and I pray that you would save them. God, I pray that you would change them and that you would redeem them and buy them back to yourself as you've promised you will. God, we trust your word and we know that you're good. And I pray all of these things today in Jesus' name.